Hello and welcome. I'm glad you could be with me tonight. As part of our leadership series, I'm talking tonight with Lynn Gordon. Many of you know her name. You know French Meadow Bakery and Restaurant. We're going to talk about some of her other businesses and about her amazing career. Lynn was awarded the Minnesota Small Business uh, Person of the Year Award many years ago. More recently, she was awarded a wonderful Lifetime Achievement Award <laughs> from the National Association of Women Business Owners. She is the founder and creator of the first certified organic bakery in the U.S., and she was way ahead of the curve. She started the French Meadow Bakery way back in 1985, and a lot of us were just learning what is organic um, back then. Bon Appetit uh, magazine has listed her restaurant and bakery as top 10 in the U.S., and I think as you listen to Lynn, you'll find that she's deeply committed to sustainable farming and healthy eating and wellness. So delighted you could be here tonight and, and share your story and stories. Thanks for having me, Mary. You have a lot of stories, and I know we're going to want more time. I'd like to go back, Lynn, to start with a sad event in your life when you were 15 mm -hmm. and your mother died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she died of cancer, and that kind of started you on a path, didn't it? Well, she was ill for three years, mm -hmm. and my father was very, very into health. He raised bees, he recycled egg cartons, he was ahead of his mm -hmm. time. He was corresponding when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer which was three years before she died, so she was actually 39. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted her to have carrot juice and, and, and actually liver and the, the Max Gerson cancer diet. The Gerson Institute exists today and many, many, many people from around the world go for cancer treatment. My mother was very conventional and in those days especially your doctor is God, you know, and not your right. husband who's a little out there, <laughs> you know. And everyone thought my dad was a health nut and, you know, he didn't want us to have sugar and it was honey and he had bees. And they, so they did, there were differences in my mother's beliefs and my father's beliefs. Hers was much more traditional. So that's really, um, I thought my dad was maybe on to something and then something so sad and drastic to lose your mother at 42 and I had a five-year-old sister and a ten-year-old sister mm -hmm. you know I became more aware and just realizing that gee maybe if my dad's right I could inherit this I could have these genes and I don't want to die so young and mm -hmm. you know maybe I should be following this path now and taking better care of myself. So that's a really young age to have that awareness, but it was forced upon me. So I know you became a macrobiotic eater. Teacher. Uh, and teacher, mm -hmm. and did that, did that start really at that age, or did you no, have a No, no, at that age, you? well, it was also a, a religious quest too, but we, you know, that, that we won't get sidetracked, but you know, my, there, my, my father was Catholic and my mother was Lutheran, so that was the other difference. So I had two pursuits. One was uh, religion and philosophy and being open to all religions because they were so set in their ways. I, I thought there's one God and, um, they're, they're both so wonderful, you know, I, I don't believe it's just so black and white, you know. So I became really open um, to almost any concept, or I just couldn't read enough about that. And on the other end, it was also I couldn't study enough about health and different diets and pavo, aerola, these are names that from you know, if if you're in your 70s maybe, and you've studied health, does it, you know? Do you know the name Pavo Erola? You know, I do okay. not. That I should. I think <laughs> he's a, he was ahead of his time. Wonderful, Dr. Weston Price uh, studied the teeth and, and the indigenous 
human indigenous people and I just couldn't get enough um, you know the Rodale press at that time mm -hmm. you know all of their magazines were mm -hmm. geared towards health so right. it was juicing it was vegetarian it was eating you know liver whatever you know I I couldn't get enough of it you know so that was a, a common theme and uh, then I went to the Himalayan Institute when probably my son, my kids were two, three, eight years old, and I just, um, I had to, something had to give in my life. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I, w I was just not happy with anything. It was just too material, and I, I wasn't living what I knew I should be, so I went for a self-transformation program where it covered the spiritual, the mental, the physical, yoga. Um, I worked in the kitchen. They followed the Gandhi principle, even though you're paying, you know, I worked cleaning bathrooms. I worked in the kitchen, the library. You get up at five in the morning with a lemon cleanse and you have a little white room with nothing on the walls, just, you know, this moment of folk, this daily focus and awareness of who you are and what you're doing and where you're going. And so it was really transforming for me. So that really was my transformation where I knew I had to do something. So your and so interest in food just it kept getting stronger than it much, sounds like. Much, much, yeah, and I wanted to share that with others, not just, you know, I came back from the Himalayan Institute and my ex-husband would come home from work, I, he, we are ex now, but um, I decided, you know, that I really wanted to be a good mother and wife, and, and but he'd say, why does our house smell like an Indian restaurant, you know, <laughs> or, you know but and I'd have uh, all, all these alternative people over, people that needed help with their diet, and I wasn't charging them. I just wanted to share what I had learned, you know, at the Himalayan Institute. So how did the bakery get started? Well, because we need to jump ahead, okay. I guess, in Well, then that led the to the Kushi Institute in Boston, okay. and so then I studied with Michio Kushi, and I went from an Indian, uh, dairy diet with sabzi, rice, and dal to learning about the macrobiotic diet. And so that is the true, now I really felt I was getting somewhere where individuals that had lung cancer and colon cancer and all sorts of lymphoma were healing. And if you remember Gloria Swanson, mm -hmm. her husband wrote the book, a pseudonym, You Are All Sanpaku and Sugar Blues. Mm -hmm. And so she was a student of Michio mm -hmm. Kushi, again, ahead of her time. Michio is from Japan, and he created the Kushi Institute and had many students from around the country. And I might add, he just died a year ago, maybe two, I was at his funeral in Brookline. Many, many famous people at his mm -hmm. funeral. Dennis Kucinich, the senator, was mm -hmm. macrobiotic, the founder of Eden Foods, the founder of Imagine Foods, the founder of Amy's. It's no surprise. The founder of French Meadow, you know, all of us um, came from, from that philosophy of that a vegan, a vegan diet, vegan. macrobiotic diet, which is grains and vegetables and seaweed and uh, um, you know, very, very, very wonderful, healthy living and eating. And so I can go on and on that such a great influence, you know, and we were, we were all there honoring him. As a young mother and starting a bakery, though, this was not easy task for you, even though you had all this <laughs> no. background yeah, and, no. and you had the motivation and the interest well, the, but the, still, you were a wild card in terms of a bakery owner, well, right? Okay, I have to say, the in-between part that's also important, I taught macrobiotic cooking to 25. I taught at the traditional center for macrobiotics. I had cooking in my home where I had 25 people that would come mm -hmm. religiously twice a week for my cooking classes. And then I would also travel the Cushy Institute, if you had cancer and you lived in Kansas, you might call the Cushy Institute and ask to have a teacher come and, and intense, intensify and intensely teach you and your family, which I would do. So I might stay for four days and we'd 
rid the house of aluminum cookware and sugar and white flour and meat and you know all of the you know I would intensely teach them this is the macrobiotic diet and uh, many Which is of them, a lot of brown rice <clears throat> yep um, grains. vegetables greens Eating seasonally, mm -hmm. very seasonally, and eating food, you know, eating food grown in your region. So we were, I was advocating local and you no know, pesticides, no herbicides, and organic. We're talking about before 1985, before French Meadow really right. started in 1978, 79. So it's an important piece. So I went to French Meadow summer camp. It Which was, was in California. In California, right. and I met Jacques Delangre, and um, that's where he was French, and, and I'm loving this, this organic, yeast-free, no sweetener bread that I could only mm -hmm. get in California from one bakery in the whole country, the Ponce mm -hmm. Bakery, and I'm shipping it back to Minnesota, and all of my students are buying it, and I felt like I was a bread broker, you know, and I always came out, I didn't have much you money, <laughs> and I'm divorced with three children, and, I, you know, $50 mattered, but I was, I'm not good with math, and so I never came out on top with the, all the bread I was ordering from California. Uh -huh. So I met Shock, and he said, oh, you'll study with me, you'll open a French a, a bakery uh -huh. in Minnesota, and so I decided to do that. And so then, kind of a leap of faith, Lynn, in a way, wasn't it? In my kitchen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought I'll sell to the co-ops little by little, you know, and that's what I did. I'd sell like six loaves, and um, there, there is a, a funny story, but I don't know. It's it's jumping. I don't know if you'd want to hear it. Oh, now that you've tempted us, we need to hear uh, it, right? Well, <laughs> years later, jumping forward, and there were many trials and tribulations. I had, you had mentioned Business Person of the Year, and 2005 was a particularly wonderful year for me, and I'd been asked to speak at the Natural Food Conference in, in Anaheim, and there were lots of people. I'm not a great speaker, and I just tell my story, you know. And after one of the an audience, one of the guests in the audience raised his hand, this cute young kid, or young man, and he said, can I tell a story? I'm from Minnesota. Oh. I know Lynn. And he said, do you remember me? I'm Aaron Corteau. And I said, oh my gosh, are you Mary's son? You know, he said, yes. Yeah. And Mary Corteau was uh, the manager of Mississippi Market. Yeah. And so uh, he said, Lynn delivered bread in the winter in this old truck. She would come in with six loaves of bread, put them on the shelf and leave. And every time I was with my mother working, you know, the hippies, the co-ops, their kids were all there. He's like, my mother would say, I feel so sorry for that poor woman. <laughs> She's divorced. She has three children. She bakes the bread. She delivers the bread. And the worst thing is, it's organic sourdough bread that no one wants. <laughs> She's oh. like, we oh, sell it because wrong. we feel sorry for her. <laughs> oh. I swear, the audience, they're just roaring because you know, now, how many we're in, at that point we were doing do 8 million loaves. I mean, we were doing bread all over the country in every natural food freezer was women's bread, men's bread, healthy hemp right. bread, French meadow bread. Anyway, so it was, uh, it got, a good res audience response. The now, I heard you say eight million loaves uh, Eight of million dollars, I'm sorry. Oh, eight, eight million, million dollars. sales, but that's I still a lot of bread. Lynn, that you, and this was from an older article, but 45,000 loaves of bread were being shipped out weekly. Um, Am I Yeah, I don't know the, the numbers because, again, I said previously, I am so not a numbers person. You know, but people would ask me what we bread. made. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I just knew that I wanted to sell bread and I needed to have it in all the stores and you know, but customers it, were loving it and that's what mattered to me. It wasn't so much, it, I just, it all worked, you know. I didn't so get rich by any means. took you know? off though, didn't it? I mean, it the took bakery off, did take it, off. It's such a, we, you know, the organic pumpkin seed and flax seed and sunflower seed and the sprouting and no yeast and it's a three-day process. It's a very time, 
consuming bread to make, and it, it, it's an art. It really is well, to like, make the bread that we did. You know, yeah, so more our art profit than margins science, were right? lower. Yes, more art than science. And it actually tested um, the Glycemic Institute right before mm -hmm. I sold French Meadow. I had the bread tested because Dr. Weil and you know Dr. Barry Sears and all of these doctors were having their pace, patients just eat the bread for mm -hmm. a week. And they said, it's a meal and a slice of bread. I can test their allergies because it's mm. so harmonious mm. and it's so good for their digestion. And so I had the bread tested for diabetes and um, it's low glycemic. So the, the Glycemic Institute gave us the seal that they- That's for, an important it's thing. It's the only bread ever is that it? has gotten two slices for diabetics our hemp men's and women's bread, which is just unheard of, you yes. know. And, and with all the diabetics oh, in our country I would now. do a show and tell them, and they were just so happy yeah. to, I mean, it sustained you. So our, you know, much of what I said on our website, and we didn't really have a website at that time, but in our promotion material was a meal and a slice of bread, and it was high protein, high fiber, naturally low in carbs, mm -hmm. like four net carbs. So this We've whole- we got some bread yes, right here on our, it's, our table <laughs> that came from your bakery. That but it's not the same functional bread that we made then. It was that, you know, this is sourdough with no sweetener and it's delicious and wonderful, but it, it isn't sprouted like uh -huh. we, the bread we made was like, it was crazy. It was wonderful. So how did the restaurant then evolve the bakery was first in 85, the restaurant French Meadow in 87. Right, How did that? It, just customers asking, you know, they mm -hmm. wanted, a, a, they at, requested that we always listen to our customers and they requested that we sell the bread at retail because if you drive by Lindale Avenue, you see there was the whole front of the bakery that's now the cafe was just empty space, and so people oh. would look in the windows and they'd see that, you know. Uh -huh. And then they say, "Why can't you do something with that? Sell, you know, sell the bread, open a bakery for us." So we did, you know, and uh, that. I, 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 pro I said we don't want a cash register, a cigar box is fine. I just couldn't imagine, it. I really didn't want to do it. I kind of did it kicking and screaming all the way, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I remember making my scones and some cookies and, you know, with organic flour and organic mm -hmm. eggs, of course, from Schultz Eggs, um, that we've been buying eggs from them for since, since the beginning. Uh -huh. And uh, it was, we. It was a dangerous neighborhood then too, mm -hmm. and the building, you know, I bought chairs for a dollar at the River Falls Library. I mean, I just, it was just put together on a dime. You know, yeah. it was the, ugh, that awful white and black tile. My dad and I did the tile. I mean, it, it was crazy. And for some reason, just people, there were so many people the first day. I don't know why I didn't advertise. I had to call the, National the cash register salesman and say we need a cash register to, right away. <laughs> don't want know. to keep the money and it's in been shoe that boxes. way. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's really you know. So there's a little bit of um, I, I don't know. It's just wonderful, you know, that I don't understand it completely because really we shouldn't have been so busy and it was embraced. Um, Really, there were coffee shops that tasted the scones and said, will you make these scones for us? We buy your bread, you know. Everyone embraced so kind of everything evolved, we did. didn't it? The, I still the, don't understand that part, the cafe part, but, yeah, it's and I'm not a restaurateur, I'm a cooking story. teacher. <laughs> the um, newest venture you have that's right on the, the um, premises is the, the Blue Stem Bar, mm -hmm. and that also, um, has a lot of meaning for you in terms of, um, you have a quote I want to ask you okay. to share yeah. that kind of explains. It's scrawled on the walls on the in wall two there. spaces, yeah. Um, tell us, okay. it's from Window Beer, I'll read, correct? Yeah, it, it's the care of the earth is our most ancient and most worthy and after all, our most pleasing responsibility to cherish what remains of it and to foster its renewal is our only hope, Wendell Berry. So, you know, so we have that on our walls. Interest in sustainability well, shows up in that 
title, The Blue Stem, which is... Right, I wanted to draw attention to the prairie grasses that we need mm -hmm. so much, and that too came from, I was meeting with Paula Westmoreland, who is a phenomenal, interesting woman that I recommend you meet, um, who wrote the book, This Perennial Land. Right. And so I've encased the book at the entrance, and we, Blue Stem Bar was simply, French Meadow is so pancakes and casual, organic, great breakfast and lunch that I, I just have such trouble getting, previously getting people to come for dinner. And especially when we got the liquor license and the wine and the beer. And so I felt like I had to have a bar. And it was a completely separate area where we had baked bread previously, which right. you saw. Right. And it was just empty and vacant. So blue stem bar emerged but Paula was the one you know I, I'm like I just don't it's just weird I don't know what to name it and she said call it blue stem bar you need to draw attention to the prairie grasses that we need them and you're already organic and you can promote my book and I'll let you have photos of farms and restorative oh. agriculture and so restorative agriculture she's a permaculturist it's taking that next step it's almost like Rudolf Steiner where if you follow the well the Waldorf and and his whole anthroposophy his philosophy of using everything you know the mm -hmm. and and growing everything and having chickens and turkeys and you know, goats and apple trees and grapevines and carrots and just the complete farm and getting away from all the soybean and corn crops, you know, that really stripped the pesticides that were used by Monsanto, stripped the land of the Blue Earth Basin. And so we have maps at Blue Stem and we tell a story as you walk back to the bathroom. There's a hallway with all of the photographs and then there's writing on the walls explaining the Ice Age and the crops, how they destroyed the land. We've got a map showing how the pesticides go down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico, the dead zone, creating the dead zone. We so very need to reverse all of this. And so one of the ways is these fallow lands with these prairie grasses, one of them being blue stem with 25 foot roots and that, you know, that, that aerates the soil and return, you know, it, it is healthy for the soil, for the ozone, all of that. So we're just restoring, you know, re, we're, we're trying, we're working at it. And also to, it, don't do sod, don't have sod anymore in your front yard, you know, in your whole yard, your front and backyard. Grow, have plants and vegetables and fruit trees and prairie grass. It's just fine. So Forget Lynn, about you're the rest. An environmentalist, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. Yes, besides so. a businesswoman, yeah. you are an environmentalist in the most yeah, I'm more than that. deepest yeah. way. Um, which maybe is one reason for your success. I mean, well, yeah, you're working with. It's real. I'm not everything, a no, you're, greenwasher, they call it. <laughs> no. We can tell that yeah. that's so no. true. Because it's become so popular, and it's become popular because all of a sudden someone said, oh, wait a minute, people are buying this. I can make money, you know. And that was not my motivation. It was the opposite in spite of myself. I, that was really a detriment for so many years, going back to that Byerly story. Uh, with my Another kids. story. I, I, we are tight on time, okay. so I can't. Okay. Can't um, ask yeah. you more about that. But your latest venture. What are you up to now? You're always up to something. Well, yeah. can we hear it here no, first? It's, well, <laughs> it, it's my Grand Avenue French Meadow, and uh, we're building a patio. We're adding or we're removing one of our parking lots on Lindale and adding a fire element and an outdoor bar and a patio, mm -hmm. and uh, we're re gaining our contract is up at the Minneapolis airport. And we've been there for 12 years. Uh, we have a partner, and they own and operate, and it's a license. And I very much am so proud of that because we get letters from travelers all over the, Spread the country philosophy. who say, I can't eat anywhere else when I travel. And so there's a French Meadow in Atlanta and Milwaukee and Salt Lake City. And so um, I'm very proud of that, that we offer healthy food to the traveler, and we have a very big name for that. Uh, 
So it is for travelers to trust. Yeah, it's really you, you are spreading spreading the the business, and, which is so good to hear. And I'm probably bringing you know my last goal. I shouldn't say last, but my um, what I think will be my last. It's like circling around, doing a full circle to the roots and where where it all began. Uh, my goal is. They failed the big company that bought French Meadows. So a few years ago, the name was given back to me. Mm. And so probably in 2018, I'm looking for buildings now to go back to bake that wonderful, oh, those okay, women's so and men's breads circle. where they said we revolutionized yeah. bread baking to offer the breads again. Because we still, even though it's been all those years, customers still ask for our functional breads. So that's what I'll be doing. Well, <laughs> and a cooking school, probably. And then oh, that's it. That's well, all. I, I'm not so <laughs> sure that's all. it with you, but um, it sounds exciting. We want to put up Lynn's uh, website. So if you can take note of this, you'll be able to keep up a little bit with what she's doing. Um, it's www.frenchmetal.com. Very easy to remember. On the website, Lynn tells tells us that there is a wonderful quote that you need to look at and I need to look at. And uh, it, it em apparently embodies a lot of what you believe then, correct? Yes, the James Beard uh, writer, Dara Moskowitz Grumble, local writer, food writer, okay. and it, she kind of sums up you French have it Meadow. in your memory? I wish I did, it? but, oh, but it's we beautiful. Oh, okay. It's on the back of our menus, okay. and it's on the website, and it's it just sums up French Meadow. She I'll basically says that. we were the first and pioneers mm. and this wonderful little organic oasis, and I love the quote. We use it everywhere. I hope she doesn't mind. Women in business ha have not had an easy time in our country, and you're just a wonderful example of, of making it work and um, in spite of a lot of hard, hard parts. So th congratulations to you, Thank Lynn. you, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. I'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.